Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Jen, for the introduction. And I would like to acknowledge and thank the Muscan people by offering these words as a contribution to the project of decolonization. On Wednesday, 2nd of September 2015, the photo of a dead, a dead boy, Aylan Kurdi, washing ashore, went viral on social media with the Turkish Twitter hashtag, humanity washed ashore. A few days later, as the media declared the refugee crisis in Europe, Germany, the US, and Britain announced that they would accept a number of the hundreds of thousands who risked their lives crossing the dangerous waters of the Mediterranean Sea and unfriendly lands in Eastern and Southern Europe as they were fleeing the latest wars of global capital in Syria, East and Sub-Saharan Africa. My leftist, my leftist friends in Europe celebrated these countries' de decisions to welcome refugees. Most noted that these countries had the obligation to do so because they are uh, directly or indirectly involved in these armed conflicts, as well as in the resource exploitation activities that, facilitate, that these facilitate. Very few were aware that these newly welcomed refugees to the UK, for instance, would join documented and undocumented migrants who are subjected to various degrees of law enforcement, from registering with the Metropolitan Police to incarceration in the many detention centers spread across the country. Following in person or in the media, the scenes and terms describing this most recent refugee crisis, I could not miss how the ratio through the figure of the human and the logic of cultural difference is the single most important political concept in the global present. For the regional wars in the Middle East, as well as the urban and rural warf warfare in economically dispossessed spaces in Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, the US, and Canada, I'm thinking here of the gang wars of in Surrey this past year, I find our part of the ethical juridic assemblage that facilitates global capitals, that is state capital <coughs> access to the productive resources, bodies and territories, it needs to reproduce itself and thrive. Well, by the way, I'm not about to give an account of the current refugee crisis, an account which would emphasize its unprecedented nature or compare it with other similar ones like the Vietnamese South Asian refugee crisis of the 1970s. My interest is in what is common between the physical and psychic violations we see unfolding in the cities and mountains of Syria, in the villages of Nigeria, in the DRC, in Turkey's border, and in the Mediterranean Sea, and those occurring in cities like Ferguson, Rio de Janeiro, Chicago, Ramallah, in the US-Mexican border, on Highway 16, in North, East, South London, and the suburbs of Paris, just to name a few. For the racial border order of global capital is everywhere and anywhere where cultural difference translates legal protection into state or state authorized violence in the name of security. So in this, which is meant as a contribution to a critique of global capital, I focus on the indistinction between refugee protection and, in this case, European border protection and propose that raciality accounts for why those displaced by the wars of global capital do not really move out of what I call the, eth the ethical zone of violence. That is, they remain nobodies as they move along, managed by a juridical apparatus with its legal and illegal parts and mechanisms. That is, the racial, a racial border which is governed by the logic of cultural difference and authorized by the eth ethical notion of the human. So my itinerary here is very simple and maybe very short. For one thing, I forgot my timer. Um, first, I look at how the logic of cultural difference informs existing critiques of global capital and Europe's response to the refugee crisis. Then I provide an example of how the human f uh, functions as a racial signifier that rules the global ethical ethic juridical apparatus. And if I have time, I will close this talk with a commentary on the kind of shift in thinking necessary for improving existing critiques of global capital. The logic of cultural difference. Okay, this is not, okay, maybe it may work. 
Hundreds of black and brown people packed in flimsy boats, dozens charging to get on trains on the secu on the, of the border of Italy and Austria, walking along barbed wires in borders of the Croatian Hungarian bo in the Croatian Hungarian border, or stuck in Calais jungle. To the images, just to remind you. Germany welcoming migrants. <laughs> Looking at these images, I see movement, a movement that does not bring about change, just repetition. The same players in the same scene, another background. See the refugees moving from a war zone at home where Assad and the US and the UK and Russia and many other smaller military groups fight for the right to the country's, to be the country's law enforcer through the war zone in Libya, just to end in the hands of undercover Austrian and now German law enforcement agents who walk through trains at the border stations asking exclusively black and brown travelers aboard for passports or other IDs. Switch channels, another video of an unarmed black person being killed by a law enforcement officer. For three decades now, the racial has authorized the deployment of deadly law enforcement measures in the guise of a war on drugs, war on terror, and now border protection. And it has become global capital's most ubiquitous and effective biopolitical strategy. So how is that that contemporary left thought misses it? You may be thinking, why bother, who cares? I do. Um, as I have said several times, and uh, actually almost two years ago in this very room, I still think that historical materialist text has something of value to offer and can regain some relevance if it becomes, excuse me, <coughs> a racial and anti-colonial critique of global capital. When making this claim, I relish in, good company, in the good company I keep, black, indigenous, Marxist, and colonial, and feminist radical thinkers of the past and present such as W.E.B. Du Bois, Franz Fanon, Milker Cabral, Aimé Césaire, Claudia Jones, Gayatri Spivak, David Lloyd, Grant Coulthard, Marina V. Schmidt, Fred Moten, Massimiliano Tomba, and Silvia Federici, to name a few. But this claim also puts me in conversation with the reactionary stream of contemporary left European thought, which claims that cultural difference and any politics framed around it is a tool of the dominant neoliberal ideology. There is much that I could say about how they get it wrong and how wrong they get it. But let me just say that in their attempts to rescue the subject and its objects from their enlightenment and post-enlightenment destiny, thinkers like Alamba Jew and Slavoj Zizek and their spe speculative realist students have not been able to think through with the most significant creation of modern philosophy, namely the figure of the other. Had they done so, they would not be so quick to dismiss. <coughs> Excuse me. As dupes of neoliberalism, those who deploy cultural difference to delimit their political position. Very problematic in this dismissal is that in it, cultural difference is a given, something that does not need to be thought. And such a view belies their commitment to the basic statements of the mode of thinking that has been so instrumental to the successful assembling and functioning of state capital. So what am I, what am I talking about? Let me highlight three aspects of their thinking. A, the rejection of the political significance of raciality, which means B, that the logic of sociology of race relations, the early 100 years old one, informs their account of racial and global issues. And this has a crucial, important result, which is that cultural difference then become the main explanation for the violence refugees meet in Europe. A violence that it is immediately removed from the current workings of state capital. Let me just... So let's read A and B in Badiou's comments on police killing of unarmed black persons in the US. 
um, comparing with France, on a re recent interview published in the International Socialist Review. He acknowledges that, quote, there is a racist dimension in the action of the police in the US and in France. But then immediately he says, except that they in, the U in the US, the problem, goes, the problem goes back a long time to slavery. It is a structural problem which is part of the entire history of the country since its beginning. But then he notes a contradiction. Do I have the contradiction here? Yeah. On the one hand, we can interpret the police killing taking place under a president who is black as the expression of a fundamental racism against black people. On the other hand, it's not the case. Obama's election points to a different reality, end quote. What's at stake? Why isn't this contradiction explored intellectually? Why does it have to be dismissed with the construct is a possibility we can, exp we can interpret that is categorically not real, it's not the case. At stake here is universalism or universality, which Badiou insists not a particular, a particular pretending to be un universal, but a universal that ensues precisely from the event that breaks through and away from all particularity, whether presented as knowledge or culture, as law or tradition. The US police cannot possibly kill black folks because they're black, because that would be racist, particularist. And since the US president is black, a member of the black particular, then racism cannot exist. Obama is universal, not only black, because white Americans voted for him. Here we have, as the underlying logic of the, of the argument, the least conceptually sophisticated explanation for racial subjugation, the one that finds its cause in individual prejudice and acts of, I think I'm stepping on something, and acts of discrimination against racially and culturally different individuals. The poverty of this logic becomes more evident when he answers questions about Islamophobia and the recent rise of the nationalist far right in France. <coughs> Badiou finds two causes for Islamophobia. The first is colonialism. In the very distant past, the Algerian war, a colonial war against the Algerian people. It, it is of an ideological nature. It is racism that can be traced back to colonialism, this feeling of superiority of the Western world, end quote. Now, the second cause is of a different order, he insists. Quoting again, after the war, we had a great number of workers coming into factories in France. And those workers were in their majority Arabs and Muslims. The great majority of Arab and Muslim workers are poor people who live in very difficult conditions in the suburbs. They are segregated because most white workers don't and, refu and often refuse to live in the same neighborhoods. So we have a mix between something of a racist, ideological nature and something of a social nature. A mix of ideological tradition in the reactionary sense and something, that, something which takes the form of class struggle. And there is this mixture that creates a very difficult situation for Arabs and Muslims, end quote. Arabs and Muslims are poor, so white French people do not want to live in the same neighborhoods. But just read this. <coughs> Quote, the essence of race relations, it is that they are the relations of peoples of diverse races and cultures which have been thrown together by the fortunes of war, end quote. This is from Robert E. Park. I think this one was published in 1925 in Race and Culture. The depoliticizing logic, logic underlying Badiou's deployment of cultural difference traces back to the 19-teens sociology of race relations accounts of the causes for prejudice, discrimination, and segregation against Southern and Eastern Europeans, East Asians, and Black, East Asian and black migrants to Northern and Eastern cities in the US. What pork attributed to skin color, odor, food, Badiou attributes to poverty. That is, since Arabs and Muslims name the poor, and since Badiou relates this poverty neither to colonial expropriation nor to capitalist exploitation in France, <coughs> he equates Arab and Muslim to poverty, which then becomes the sole reason for their segregation. Nothing economic or political or juridical in the present accounts for it. 
Once Algerians have arrived in France to be exploited by capital, they were no longer colonized subjects. All traces of that juridic economic relationship vanished. Once workers in France, they are only identified by cultural denominations, Muslims and Arabs. Finally, because the French Republic has, Republic has nothing to do with the plight of Arabs and Muslims in today's France, Badiou can propose that the only solution to curb the racist far right is a return to, I quote, the true Republican, tra Republican tradition of equal education. So now let me turn to Zizek's blog on the refugee crisis for an example where cultural difference provides the logic of the argument while while being rejected as an organizing principle of European existence. In the blog post titled, We Can't, titled, we can't Address the EU, the EU Refugee Crisis Without Confronting Global Capitalism, end quote, he calls on the left to face the new challenge brought by global capital, the endless flows of refugees to come, and he chastised them for condemning, or, condemning ordinary Europeans' expressions of concern with the refugees' negative impact on their way of life. Zizek offers four prescriptions for dealing with these brave new times. The second one is, <coughs> Europe should organize itself and impose clear rules and regulations. State, state control of the stream of refugees should be enforced through a vast administrative network encompassing all the European Union to prevent uh, local barbarisms like those of the authorities in Hungary and Slovakia. Refugees should be reassured of their safety, but it should also be made clear to them that they have to accept the area of living allocated to them by European authorities. Plus, they have to respect the laws and social norms of European states. No tolerance of religious, sexist, or ethnic violence on any side. No right to impose on others one's way of life or religion. Respect of every individual's freedom to ab abandon his or her communal, cu communal customs, etc. If a woman chooses to cover her face, her choice should be respected. But if she chooses not to cover it, her freedom to do so has to be guaranteed. Yes, such a set of rules privileges the Western European way of life, but it is the price for European hospitality. These rules should be clearly stated and, and enforced by repressive measures against foreign fundamentalists as well as against our own anti-immigration, immigrant racists, if necessary." End quote. <coughs> well, assimilation, regulation, and repression of barbarism, if necessary, to ensure that liberty and equality between men and women continue to prevail in Europe. That's one of his solutions. Only the logic, us versus them, the logic of cultural difference, supports his argument. It has no capacity to consider how these us, Europeans, and them, non-European refugees, have emerged over centuries entangled in a juridic economic architecture, the colonial matrix, which necessitates total violence in order to create lands and labor for exploitation. For Zizek, as for Badiou, the order is given in skin color, religion, language, or origin, outside the circuit of capital. Only the European worker, those who lost access to land and became available as wage labor due to, due, due to the enclosures beginning in the 16th century, count. The colonized and, this, and the enslaved have no significance to their critique of capital, of global capital. They belong in the past. A common case of hysterical historical blindness to which I may or may not return at the end of this talk. So let me now turn to the biopolitical framework the EU deployed to welcome refugees and give you a sense of how it already implements Zizek's second recommendation, precisely because it also follows the same logic. But before, first I need to remind you of the international legal framework that hold these countries accountable for the situation of refugees trying to get or arriving in Europe. The legal framework for refugee protection, which is part of the Human Rights Charter and international law, includes three main documents. The 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugee in the aftermath of the Second World War, 
and it still has a prevailing, it, it is still the prevailing rationale, which is that states have the responsibility to protect their citizens. And then when they, it cannot do so, then the international community steps in to protect the, uh, those basic rights of refugees. The other document is the 1969 Organization of African Unity Convention governing the specific aspects of refugees, refu refugee problems in Africa. And the last one is the 1984 Cartagena Declaration covering the situation of Latin American refugees. When combined, these three documents assemble the proper refugee as someone who has a well-founded fear of persecution because of his or her race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion, and who is outside of his her, or outside his or her country of origin and is unable or unwilling to avail himself or herself of the protection of that country or to return there for fear of persecution. Any person compelled to leave his or her country owing to external aggression, occupation, foreign domination, or events seriously disturbing public order in either part or the whole of his country of origin or nationality. And persons who flee their countries because their lives, safety, or freedom have been threatened by generalized violence, foreign aggression, internal conflicts, massive violations of human rights, or other circumstances which have seriously disturbed public order. Any legal document, as any legal document, the refugee protection framework establishes a negative right, the right not to be returned or the right to stay. Now, towards meeting this international legal obligation to protect today's uh, refugees' right to stay, the states that have signed this document and multilateral entities like the EU have set up juridical structures which over the year, have over the years, but in particular, in particular after 9-11, they have increasing, increasingly focused on law enforcement. Uh, on a, sorry, on a law enforcement management setup designed either to keep refugees away, uh, which include the outsourcing um, of asylum seekers to neighboring countries, or keeping them in detention centers of, uh, off their shores, like in the case of Australia. Not surprisingly, the European Union announced its response to the refugee crisis of 2015 on the 23rd of September with the release of the European Agenda on Migration. Let me. A migration ma management program which pledges the release of extra financial and other resources to be allocated to border enforcement in Europe, neighboring countries, and in North Africa and also in North Africa and also in the refugee's places of origins. When reading the document, it is difficult to miss the distinction between refugee protection and border protection. Virtually all measures announced to welcome refugees are designed to protect Europe from the flood. From the flood. Um, so just take a read at Jean-Claude Juncker, the president of the European Commission, when he's announcing uh, the measures. He says, in spite of our fragility, our self-perceived weaknesses, today it is Europe that is sought as a place of refuge and exile. This, um, this is something to be proud of, though it is not without its challenge. The first priority today is and must be addressing the refugee crisis, the decision to relocate 160,000 people from the most affected member states is a historical first and genuine laudable expression of European solidarity. And I don't think I have enough time, but I will just pass the slides to show you what Canada has been doing, um, which is really not much different. I don't know if you have heard that statement before, but if you take a look at Welcome Canada, you find that the plan includes steps that focus primarily on ensuring security and, and to do so, that they have several steps in which uh, the identity of anyone uh, claiming refugee status will be uh, checked and double checked. And then if you look at the agenda, 
you have a look at the organizations that are responsible for the resettlement of the 20,000 refugees that Canada is uh, welcoming now. And this is the order that they appear, so you can see that the law enforcement ones are the ones that deal with them first, and then you have others um, more related to health and other aspects. But there are way too many uh, law enforcement agencies for it to be a really warming welcome. But anyway, um, so to recall, my argument is that raciality provides the ethical devices such as racial difference and cultural difference that function as signifiers who, the, the work which, who, which work by collapsing protection into security. As in, this case, where as in this case, where administration of justice, such as ensuring the refugee right to stay, becomes management through law enforcement with distinct levels of lethality. Every time they are deployed in such a context, they write the racial subaltern bodies and territories as signifiers of violence, <coughs> a move that effectively and immediately orders and authorizes as it justifies deployment of law enforcement under the guise of protective, protective measures. In the name of self-preservation, as in Zizek's blog and the EU framework. Um, in sum, the racial orders provides the logic for bad use, and more so in G for Zizek's explanation for the violence migrants and refugees from former European colonies face in the lands of equality, liberty, and universality, and also in their outposts in the Americas and Oceania. Now that we have seen how the logic of cultural difference orders both critical discourses and the EU biopolitical apparatus, and well, in Canada too, I will shift to another level and move on to consider the racial signifier that authorizes displacing of the others of Europe, the placing of the others of Europe in the zone of violence. Many of you I know are familiar with Sylvia Winter's critique of the human, in which she highlights the overrepresentation of Westerns concept of man in two moments, in the pair rational-irrational and then in the distinction between those selected and those deselected by evolution. My take on the relationship between racial and, hu and the, the racial and the human differs from uh, Winters in a very small but important way. I'm more interested in the fundamental sameness between both moments and pairs than in their classi classificatory operation that is the hierarchy they, they produce. Uh, this is a bit complicated, so I will uh, just say that by fundamental sameness, I mean the philosophical context of emergence and the social scientific conditions of productions of the tools of raciality, in particular the concepts of the racial and the culture role, which could only be assembled after the deployment of the Enlightenment notion of the human. To simplify a bit, I'm not interested in calling out moments of deployment of the binary like Zizek's distinction between racist and fundamentalist, which he names, and the universalist that he doesn't name. What interests me is how the human does the work of racial power, how it positions the others of Europe, persons and places in affectability as subjects of violence, authorizing the deployment of total violence against them. And, not, and, I'm, so I'm, and I'm not interested in stating that the human does so. Now, I could make this point by going through a review of modern philosophy, beginning with the Kant's articulation of dignity as a distinguishing trait of humanity, and then follow on to Hegel's program, which enables the ascension of culture as the privileged post-enlightenment post ontological descriptor. And I would move through 19th century science of man, and then stop at the 20th century, anthropo at 20th century anthropologist deployment of cultural difference, which is sustained by the thesis of human unity and diversity, but I'm not going to do that. So instead, I'm going to talk about a movie. Um, the adaptation of P.D. James' 1992 book, Children of Men, which was directed by Alfonso Cuaron, who also co-authored the script with Timothy Sexton. The film is set in London in 2021, 20, 18 years after the last human being was born. In it, London, London streetscapes is like a mix of a war zone and a concentration camp. 
Um, it is destroyed by bombings, peppered with cages holding refugees from everywhere because the UK was then was the only country with a still functioning government. It is a dictatorship, but it's still functioning. Uh, we see scenes of the Royal, Armies, of Royal Army soldiers performing some of the executions of refugees on sidewalks, corrupt refugee camp guards doing all kinds of dealings. And near the end, the images of the uprising in the back seal refugee camp involving the Royal Army, the fishes, and the gangs. And the fishes are um, a ter terrorist group. Um, I don't know if I can manage to show you any images. Or maybe I can. Um, yeah, I have this image. Oh. Show you a little bit these near the end, the images of the refugee camp. That's very quick, this one. <laughs> I may have time to go back to it. Um, let me have some water. Now that the, this film is a political commentary on the situation of undocumented migrants and refugees, there is no doubt. And it's from 2006, by the way. For the screenwriter, director, Coron, um, and now I have to go back to something else. Um, for the director Koran, quoting, the fact that this child uh, sorry, I'm, okay, anyway, I'll tell you the story a bit later. Let's go through the quotes. The fact that this child will be the child of an African woman has to do with the fact that humanity started in Africa. We are putting the future in, of humanity in the hands of the dispossessed and creating a new humanity to spring out of that. So in his view, his creative contribution to social, this is the, his creative contribution to social and global justice, but let me just now go to the storyline. The storyline that I'm part, the part I'm focusing on is that Julian, who is a terrorist played by Julian Moore, she asks her husband, Theo Fallon, who is played by Clyde Owen, for help getting transit papers for Key, who is this um, teenager, this sub Saharan African uh, teenage girl <coughs> who is pregnant, and Miriam, the black Caribbean midwife. And the, the reason they need help is because they have to reach the sea in order to be picked up by the Human Project, which is a group of scientists who are still hoping to find a cure for infertility, because you know, uh, the, low, the last human being was born 18 years ago. Now, Luke, who is uh, Chotel Ejofor, and other members of the fishes, they had a different plan. They want to keep key the teenage girl and the baby in London, and used them as leverage in the refugees' war against the government. Well, humanity began in Africa, it ended in Europe, and in the film, an ordinary Englishman, Theo, will escort and protect the future of humanity from the government, the police, the fishes, and also the gangs involved in this uh, war in that refugee camp. In this film about social justice, a reluctant hero Theo sacrificed himself to save two black women, he and her baby girl, from everyone else, but primarily from the black, brown, and Eastern European terrorist group, members of the terrorist group, the fishes. So the end of humanity is presented to us in, a beautifully, shot, in beautifully shot scenes of violence in the streets of London and in the roads in the countryside of England. Invo the, those fights involved law enforcement uh, and quarons dispossessed primarily. Every time I watch this film, I wonder about the filmmaker's choice between what I'll call a politically charged and an ethically charged message, charged message. The version exhibited in the movie theaters and available electronically conveys the former. 
Near the end, Theo rescues Ki and the baby from the fishes, the terrorists, in the soon-to-be-obliterated um, camp. And as Theo is about to leave, the two, the wounded um, Luke, is your four, points his gun to Theo and says, I quote, I'm tired. Julian was wrong. She thought it would be peaceful. How can it be peaceful when they try to take away our dignity? Now, in a copy of the script that I found online, as you can see, it reads, no, 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 you don't understand, Fallon. It's happening. I did what Julian couldn't. I called for the national uprising, and the people have responded, not only here, all over England. I made it happen. They followed me. Whatever end quote, whatever went on at the cutting board or marketing meetings, whatever the decision to change the tax took place, when the ethical term dignity replaces the political term uprising, it results in that the film positions the refugees exactly where they belong in regard to the prevailing global tax governed by the notion <coughs> of the human. Here, the term dignity hijacks an otherwise politically charged film in the images we see by writing the dispossessed, the refugee, fully immersed in violence. Not political violence, but in a violence that is a reaction to moral degradation, not being valued as, valued as a human being, and for that reason subjected to excess brutal policing. Lacking its political tenor, the choice to fight and die becomes even less a sign of an inher inherent humanity, self-determination, when contrasted with the English people, with how English people, sorry, with the white English people in the TV ads who have the power to decide to die by taking quietus, which is a poison that is advertised everywhere in the film. They take quietus to end their lives, their hopeless existence peacefully. Now refugees die in war zones and camps, British, British citizens in their bathtubs or swimming pools. How does this work? How is it that dignity, used in a single scene against the background of total violence, returns the violence, suffered, the violence to the sufferer, to the racial subaltern, as its own, as a, its sole ontological descriptor, without the need to articulate the reasons why it is so? You are probably thinking, yes, of course, in a film, uh, you know, most of the work is done by the images, the visual in the scenes, and not so much the words. It's true, but it is also true that the same work is done in the videos of refugees we see online on TV, and, the and in the Austrian border, when, when the Austrian border enforce law enforcement officer selects do to ask for documents on the train, only those who um, are only the black and brown folks who are traveling from Italy to, uh, uh, who are coming in trains from Italy. My point is, I guess, too complex to summarize here, but the gist of it is that the connections don't happen at the level of senses, of the senses, on what you see, but at the level of thinking. The conclusion you reach, as you see, it is based on what we already know. For the Austrian undercover officers and the white passengers on, the, on that train at the border of Italy and Austria, the black and brown passengers were undocumented migrants, refugees, until they produced the papers that took them back into legality. Um, I, have, I have a little bit of time. Maybe I'll stop here. Um, if you want to ask any questions. If I don't stop here, I'll give you just about 10 minutes for questions. What do you think? Nobody thinks anything. I'll keep going and you're not asking me any questions, okay? <laughs> and it doesn't complicate my narrative. And I think when I say how it doesn't, I'll be very offensive. Uh, and 
<laughs> well, there are so many ways of beginning this. Um, but I think the least offensive way of saying how it doesn't complicate my narrative is something that I did not emphasize when I was showing, when I was talking about um, the, Europe the, president, the president of the European uh, Commission words, and then also the introduction to Canada's welcome refugees. And the fact is that the notion of the human is a very little perverse uh, signifier because what it does is to allow us to make a statement um, along the lines of human solidarity and unity that makes us look, to say it simply, look good because we cherish our ethical values, our notion of the human, while at the same time, in the very movement, in that, that very movement, it can displace those who are, we are helping and construct them as less than human. Uh, and that's the perversity of it. Um, so in terms of the churches and even the whole notion of humanitarian values, that's kind of what it does because it allows uh, that we make uh, gestures and statements and policies that are geared towards helping those who are suffering in war, zone, war zones by placing it as just a relationship between us in which our gesture towards helping, and helping them makes us look as people who really embrace and cherish our value, humanity, but we do so without acknowledging the very deep ways in which we are already complicated in that, that very situation and the ways in which, you know, we participate in the wars in Congo just by using those things. And that's not just a gesture, the complications of the kinds of the minerals that are in here and the of. So that's why, you know, it doesn't complicate. Um, Yes? Hi, I'm going to read from the Dean. She's, she's got a really sore throat and, so, and no voice. So I'm just going to read a question. Hi, I just got back last night from London and happy to be here to ask this. My uh, voice is shocked. <laughs> Two days ago, Cameron used the threat of Calais refugees being unleashed if the UK did not stay in the EU citing the Anglo-Franco agreement breaking down. We also have Merkel and the crushing of Greek autonomy while being touted as a hero to refugees, uh, though Greece is a frontline arrival. Could you comment on this layer of policing refugees externally and internally and trying to discipline Britons into staying in the EU with the threat of um, flooding refugees? So you want me to say more about it? Because <laughs> I think, I was, is there something else that I, you would like me to say in terms of commenting on the policing and uh, <coughs> refugee the, the fact that the refugee resettlement measures focus primarily on border enforcement and keeping them? Um, or maybe I missed something in your introduction to the question. Uh, just the sense of everyday people's responses. Um, well, mm -hmm. not just governmental levels, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, really, I don't know if I can say much more because I may have missed some of what is in your introduction. Because I think what I was talking about here, if I understand you correctly, you're asking me to comment on the policing, right? It's more about the keeping the EU together. Oh, okay, and, okay, and okay. A, like this weird tension that I see, like Britain's being threatened with, with like we have to stay in where we want to be because these refugees will flood. Like that's it. It just seems like a very. Right I think thing. that's I think that's something that was very clear in in the the president of the EU Commission um, <coughs> statement because when he say he's talking about the European solidarity and also the distribution of resources is. The distribution of resources is primarily to be given to European countries, uh, mostly um, Eastern European and Greece and Italy, in order to help them to deal with the crisis. So I think, I I in terms, I mean, if we can describe this as a European crisis, it is a European crisis that, uh, because it also, um, is, it does, time is done, because it does um, a couple of things. 
One of the things that it does, it exposes the very internal difference in Europe, not only those between the members of the, the EU member states and those who are not, but also the very look, those, the countries that, are, that receive refugees first, they are on the outskirts of Europe. So that is something that, um, at least in the case of Turkey, we have seen that one of the solutions that they have to this problem, not of keeping the EU together, but actually keeping the EU as something good to be preserved, is the fact that they are now, uh, that Germany is, and the EU is offering Turkey uh, some, um, how do I say that? They're bribing Turkey to keep the refugees there by offering, you know, quicker entry into the EU <coughs> and also offering resources. So, so on the one hand, that is, this, um, that is the refugee crisis, which is about the relationship between Europe and elsewhere and its former colonies. And then on the other hand, that, that is a third hand there, that is a re relationship between I inside of Europe where the, the wealth is concentrated in, in the inner countries, right? And then like the outliers, the, the UK and the northern countries where the, the, other, the refugees actually want to go. And that is the third hand that I can't um, it's, uh, I can't talk about now, but I will remember it later. <laughs> Sorry, there is a third hand in, the, in there. But I think that's the other side of it. But, the, but if you look at, um, there is a racial dimension to that too. L let's not talk about Turkey, but if we look at what happened, uh, well, if you look at descriptions of Europe from the 19th century, you find um, very well delineated racial maps which limit Europe to Western Europe and Northern Europe and keeps uh, the Eastern Europe and Southern Europe completely outside of that particular racial, which was described as a racial and cultural entity. So there are different ways in which we can talk about what's happening in terms of how they are dealing with um, the, very, the con contradictions in the EU, but actually even talking about those contradictions would not take us away from the significance of the racial logic because that racial logic is very much tied to. Say it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> JP? Hi. Um, so I was wondering if I can invite you to say a bit more about the relationship between the juridical legal construction of the human and the scientific medical construction of the human. Um, they butt heads in the human project, right? In, 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 in the way that a scientist is trying to kill or are trying to solve uh, infertility. Um, and also, I suppose, in the enrollment of public health, the Public Health Agency of Canada, in, um, mm -hmm. in both refugee protection and national securitization. Uh, so I was wondering uh, if you could say more about the relationship between those two. Um, I can say some things about the relationship between the two of them. Um, I could think I, I can talk about the Zika virus, but then it will make me sound a bit like a conspiracy theorist, and I swear <laughs> I'm, not, so I'm not going to say. I'm just raising the Zika virus. Um, but I think they come together in um, the other aspect of security, which is human, human security, right? Uh, and human security includes more than you know, acts of total violence that can decimate the population, et cetera, but it's also tied to the health risks brought by those people from those places that, um, well, in the case of the Zika virus, we are not sure if it's because of climate change or because of genetically modified mosquitoes that, that have been released in Brazil and other places in order to take care of the dengue virus or if it's because of both, um, you know. But in any way, in any case, uh, the others of Europe become a threat to human security from a health, a public health perspective, precisely because of the situations we found, find in the countries where uh, we come from. <laughs> Any more questions? We have five minutes. No more questions? Should I bore you with my conclusion? Okay, so we end with the conclusion, not questions. Anyway, so.
Um, I don't know, okay. Uh, so that's all about Canada, and I, I think I don't have something here. So anyway, the conclusion, and it will take me probably six minutes, so we'll be done by one after one. Um, so here is Zizek's uh, final recommendation for dealing with the refugee crisis in Europe. It is the Commons, and I'm going to quote. The most difficult and important task is a radical economic change that should abolish social conditions that create refugees. The ultimate causes, cause of refugees is today's global capitalism itself and its geopolitical gains. And if we do not transform it radically, immigrants from Greece and other European countries will soon join African refugees. When I was young, such an organized attempt to regulate the commons was called communism. Maybe we should reinvent it. Maybe this is, in the long term, our only solution." End quote. <clears throat> so let me close this talk with some comments on what kind of shifting in thinking I find it's necessary if we, the left, are to assemble an alternative to global capital, one that does not reproduce its colonial racial conditions of possibility, which is racial violence. So let me explain my terms very quickly. Racial violence, I argue, is the work of the juridical and ethical apparatus of global capital, and it takes the form of symbolic violence at the level of representation and total violence, the work of colonial modalities of power, expropriation of land, labor, and lives. What I find the considerations of the, common po of the commons politics and its philosophical contemporary, uh, speculative realism, is an indifference to racial violence, which includes the deployment of its logic, that the logic which is cultural difference, that belies a um, one-dimensional mode of thinking. Like Zizek's fourth conditions, where the possibilities for a different mode of existence without state capital only comprehends the expropriation processes that take place in Europe, such as the enclosures, from the 16th century, and the expropriation of surplus value produced by wage labor uh, from the 19th century, 18th century on. There is no attention to how state capital also necessitates the mechanisms of total violence that ensure the expropriation of the productive capacity of native lands and slave labor in the Americas, and how it continues to reproduce itself through the deployment of total violence and symbolic violence that both create the conditions for today's flow of refugees while at the same time justify the assembly of protective mechanisms which result in so many deaths in the waters of the Mediterranean Sea, the incarceration in camps such as the jungle in Calais. Even more insidious is how this one dimensionality is presented as a departure from modern philosophy, in particular a move away from the conventional figurings of the subject and the object. For Alain Badiou and his students, it seems that emancipating the subject from the position of superiority, authority, or mastery over things or humans is enough of a gesture to release it from its context of emergence and dissemble the consequences of its deployment. As, in the force of, as if the force of the modern subject does not remain in that which has become available for thinking, object, and the other, only because it was produced in a mode of knowledge that is grounded upon a founding relation. That is, as if announcing the possibility of knowing without the presupposition of correlation, Meliasu, would suffice to liberate objects from the meanings and functions attached to them in the moment of naming. Or as if announcing the appearance of a, uh, of a subject that it is related to nothing but the event, but you, would suffice to liberate others, those he derives for holding on to cultural difference, from the meanings and functions attached to them in the moment of naming. Part of the problem is that one-dimensional thinking addresses both a state capital and its figure of authority, the party and the subject, horizontally. That is, because they assume that these juridical, economic, and symbolic entities have emerged and thrive in a context that is only historically, that is temporally defined, and, that, and as such it is either homogeneous, post-enlightenment Europe and North America, or is in the process of becoming so, as in some early descriptions of globalization as a process of homogenization. As such, it fails to take into account the other two moments of, of the founding violence of state capital, conquest, settlement, colonization, and slavery. I think it is time we stop privileging linear time. 
Lately, I have been considering a kind of thinking that is at least four-dimensional if we remain limited, limited to our sensorial cap capacities, and I call it poetical thinking or imaging. Let me explain. Four-dimensional thinking, thinking is complex and compositional. In addition to horizontality, length, or extension, it acknowledges that existence unfolds in three other dimensions. It has depth, height, and more importantly, symmetry. For a from a conventional materialist perspective, any instance, moment, or event has three dimensions because it happens somewhere, location, and somehow with some form in space. And as such, its figuring attends to its length, height, and depth all at once. Now, from what I call a raw materialist perspective, being material, what happens is, all, is always also a composition, a decomposition or recomposition, always already also a reassembling of, that, of what has happened before and of what has yet to happen. By recalling, so just recall uh, quantum entities that enter in the composition of everything that exists uh, in the universe. Now, that thinking demands that we abandon or decenter time, Einstein's fourth dimension, conceived as the arrow of time, because it accounts so much for the prevailing one dimensional thinking, and also for our inability to, simultaneous, to, see simultaneously, to see simultaneously that what happens takes place in space and hence has at least uh, two other dimensions. Borrowing from Walter Benjamin, it is possible to think of a moment of occurrence distinguished from a location of occurrence with an image, a composition which has similarities with other compositions that have happened and are yet to happen. And the attention to these similarities would entail looking for symmetries, other correspondences that have the characteristics of fractal figures in the sense that they repeat at different scales. When expanded beyond these one-dimensional temporal thinking, the present situation is no longer a crisis, but it is the usual business of global capital. And Zizek's reading of it is just a rearticulation of the racial logic that orders it all, and not a radical the radical critique he hopes. For a poetical imaging of the present situation would find how this, his language of assimilation and the impulse to protect our white European way, way of life is but a repetition of the terms and logic deployed about 100 years ago when Anglo-American workers in the, in, the US, in the US, East and Midwest cities, uh, protested against the influx of Southern and Eastern European immigrants, as well as Asians and US blacks fleeing the total violence of Jim Crow. And the protest was on the basis that they would not assimilate and that they would lower existing standards of life. A poetical thinking as a creative imaging designed to interrupt such symmetries would do, would do so precisely because the attention to the symmetries immediately instantaneously locates this particular event in the global context, and a global context that has been designed by the many previous and future iterations of the fin founding violence of capital in all the shapes it takes. By that I mean that poetical thinking images the globe not as the ultimate, but as a situa as situated in the, co uh, not as the ultimate context, but as situated in the cosmos, where space-time does not matter, but in which every event occurs in a complex context, always already occupied downwards, upwards, as well as sideways by other past and future instants and instances of deployment of the colonial racial machinery to which it would be impossible to remain indifferent. Thank you.